folks, Dave here, and welcome to this early introduction to all of Battlefield 5's maps. There are eight maps in total at launch, with one more coming in early December. In this guide, I'm going to give you guys an overview of each map, with a couple of suggestions from the time that I've been able to spend on them already before launch, thanks to the EA Game Changer program. This video will be a good way to get a quick head start as you dive into the game for the first time. I'm going to put time codes in the description if you guys want to jump to a specific map. In this guide, I'm going to cover mostly the conquest mode for these maps, as it is the most popular mode in the Battlefield series, but these suggestions should work for basically all of the modes that these maps are playable on. Without any further ado, let's go ahead and dive in with Aerodrome. This is going to be a medium-sized map in just about all modes, and features a half-destroyed German airfield in the North African desert. While DICE's promotional materials have focused on the central hangar as the focal point for this map, there's actually quite a good number of points spread out across the entire map. Again, it is still just medium-sized, but there's a large amount of cover across the burning airfield and all of the irrigation canals and canyons throughout the entire area that provides a lot of flanking options and a lot of room to move around. This map wasn't very high on my list until I actually got a chance to play it, because I was surprised to see that all the action isn't just limited to the hangar area itself. If your team wants to secure the win on Aerodrome, you're going to have to watch those outlying points and not just get bogged down in that hangar fighting. While there aren't a lot of ground transport vehicle options for infantry, if one of your team members spawns in a light tank and uses that as a quick capture tool for those outlying points, you might end up capturing almost all of the peripheral points and forcing the enemy to defend that central hangar location. The team defending the hangar needs to not rely on the side hallways because they're essentially just corridors of death, with doors that open at both sides and at multiple points all the way down those side corridors. If you're going to defend them, make sure that you're hiding in one of the few available corners, or guarding from the inside hangar doors. Next up, let's look at Eris, another medium-sized map in Conquest that I was actually quite worried about looking at the overview map. It looked very, very crowded from the top-down view. The good news is, this is one of the most densely detailed maps in the entire game, providing a ton of flanking and routing options for infantry. While there are a lot of vehicle spawns, at least two to three tanks and airplanes per team at any given time, there is so much cover available on this map, from the creek beds to the hedgerows to the village section in the center. Infantry have plenty of good places to hide from the more powerful vehicles. Just move carefully. If you're running armor on this map, you're going to have to watch for enemy tanks bursting through those hedgerows at surprise locations. Remember that infantry can spot you with a double tap of Q and provide their friendly team's armor your exact location, so watch for surprise ambushes. At the same time, if you're using the roadways as armor, make sure that you're watching the ground for mines at choke points, bridges, as well as slight rises in the road, because the infantry are going to love mining every possible road as they're running by. If you're flying on this map, you are going to have to watch out for pretty frequent flak because while the ground has plenty of cover to move around in that makes the map feel larger, in the air, things are pretty crowded around those central control points. One final warning for the infantry, while you can crawl through that long grass, remember, it does react with physical movement to your movement, so enemies are going to be able to spot you moving even if they can't see you directly. Next up, we'll continue our journey across the French countryside by looking at Twisted Steel. This map very obviously has a massive destroyed bridge as its center focal point. Don't get too bogged down there though, even though it is a nice high ground with views of a lot of the map, because this map has a lot of different control points, only two of which are on that bridge. Outside of the bridge, you have five other flags, so again, if your team gets stuck trying to contest the bridge, you could end up losing the match. If you're a tank player here on Twisted Steel, you're going to have a rough go of it, because the infantry have not only tons of cover, but you have very limited driving routes. You're going to be stuck to some of the low-lying swamp areas for transportation, as well as some of the smaller bridges and roadways on the southern side of the map. This will create focal points where you're going to be funneled into, allowing infantry the opportunity to hit you with Panzerfausts, or of course their usual mine lane tricks. A word of caution for bomber players in the air on this map, 
if you try and drop bombs on the bridge points themselves, you're going to have to be very careful to get those bombs in between the struts of the bridge to actually impact on the road surface, because if you bomb the top of the bridge, you're not going to get those kills. With the next map, we're going to return to the North African desert with Hamada. As DICE describes it, one of the largest maps in the history of the entire Battlefield series, and definitely the largest map in Battlefield 5's launch lineup. Of course, you guys know, I love the large maps in the Battlefield franchise. The more vehicles, the better. I'm also happy to see here that in Hamada, DICE has returned to the tradition of providing a lot of transport vehicles for both teams. If you're on foot, you're not going to be stuck on foot for long if you don't want to be. Given how spread out these capture points are, and how many of them there are, this is yet another map where light tanks are going to be very useful for capping those far-flung points. The key thing to remember here is, there's going to be a lot of enemy armor, most likely medium or heavier tanks. So, if you're out there capturing a flag in a light tank, make sure you stay hidden because enemy armor is going to be able to pick you off from a pretty good ways away. This map has some very open sight lines. Because of all those open sight lines, infantry are going to want to use as many of those transport vehicles as they can, and you're going to want to watch for the glint of enemy sniper rifles if you're having to cross open terrain on foot. If you're contesting G-Flag, remember, this airfield location is actually a spawn location for enemy aircraft, like previous Battlefield titles. As you're burning that flag, watch the airfield in case an enemy pilot spawns in and tries to get away with that spawnable aircraft that's given to whoever owns that G-Flag. If you're not ready for the spawn, he might just get away with it. The next map we're going to focus on is one of the most unusual ones in the entire game, Fiel 652. This is initially an infantry focused map set high in the Norwegian mountains, with the interesting addition of a lot of aircraft spawns as well. This means that if one team is able to dominate the sky, they will have free reign to harass all of the capturing infantry down at the points below. This is also where some of the higher end unlocks for the bomber classes of the aircraft are really going to come into play. The abilities that unlock additional bombs for the medium and heavy bomber classes allow the aircraft to have devastating effect when targeting infantry down on the ground below. If one team is too clustered into one gigantic group while trying to capture flags, a single bombing pass could prove devastating. If your team is having a hard time controlling the air, however, there are plenty of flak locations at each flag. The craggy mountain peaks in between each flag make it hard to get a lot of flak fire directly onto enemy aircraft, and pilots that are paying attention will be able to dive quickly to avoid that incoming AA fire. At the same time, a good ambush can quickly take out a damaged aircraft. If you're playing mostly on the ground for this map, you're going to want to avoid that Zerg rush. Don't just run from point to point. Try and organize at least one squad to stay back behind and defend captured points. Yet another new map in Battlefield 5 that took me by surprise was Devastation. This map is set in Rotterdam, but after a massive German aerial bombardment. Despite being a mostly claustrophobic city map, it has an incredible amount of flanking options, with the ability to go several city blocks left and right of the objective in breakthrough mode. Although I did enjoy this map, in conquest mode it really does shine in breakthrough. It also has some of the most stunningly realistic lighting and effects of any map in the entire game. Again, I'm just really impressed with how many options DICE designed into this map for movement and navigation. If you're going to survive for very long at all on Devastation, you're going to have to either stick with your squad or your entire team, because the enemy can come from so many different surprise locations. The Central Cathedral only contains one capture point, but it has several different routes that it can be attacked from, including from a large library and the upper balcony. Defending this point is very difficult because of all the attack routes, but also the capture area is very, very large, so an entire squad could possibly hide out of sight even as the enemy moves in. This map is also a great place to try out the new medium machine guns. If you find a good bipod location, you can take out entire squads on your own, at least until a sniper's bullet finds you. If you're driving armor on this map, expect not to last long and just play aggressively. Support your team where you can and go down fighting. 
That brings us at long last to our two beta maps. Now, most players are pretty familiar with these having played them during the beta, so I'm going to focus on changes that you guys can expect here in the launch version of Battlefield 5. First up, Narvik. This Norwegian map has had quite a few changes done to its lighting and visuals. The snow effects have been toned down, which leaves you with a much clearer picture as you're navigating the map. But don't worry, those snow effects didn't go to complete waste. Weather effects can still move in and make visibility much more difficult. It's just not the default state of the map anymore. Interior lighting has also been improved, making it much easier to see players as you're navigating through the structures on this map. And now for the last map, let's look at the final version of Rotterdam. Chronologically, this map is before Devastation, and is the version of the city before it was destroyed, although this is a completely separate section of the city, so don't worry about recycling of map layouts here. The lighting here on Rotterdam has also been greatly improved, making soldiers much more visible even in the shadows, with less of a extreme contrast between light and dark areas. This should both be a lot easier on your eyes, and make players a bit easier to spot seeing we no longer have the 3D spotting mechanics of previous Frostbite Battlefield titles. Although this city map has quite a few flanking options, it's not quite as wide open as Devastation as far as options go, and so fortifications are going to play a pretty big role here. I saw players building large amounts of fortifications in all modes, both Conquest as well as Grand Operations, and it really does make a difference. A solid sandbag defensive bunker with firing platforms can completely control one of those main roads or those side alleyways. I also discovered that while those light tanks are great for zooming around for a bat capture, on this map, you're not going to last long. Those light tanks can be quickly ambushed and damaged so heavily from any direction that I really wouldn't bother with them on this map. Spawn in the medium or heavier tanks and try to survive a bit longer as you're supporting your team and capping points. This is not quite the map where you want to try that quick light tank capture flank. It's just not going to work out well for you in most cases. And there you have it guys, our 8 launch maps, all of which I can honestly say I did enjoy. I do have my favorites, and I do think that both Rotterdam and Narvik were some of the weakest maps for DICE to showcase in the alphas and betas, but yeah, overall, I really enjoyed all of these, and I really can't wait to dive back in on my own personal setup here and get some more time on my favorite of these, the large vehicle maps, and some of those surprisingly good maps as well, like Eris and Devastation. For now, stay tuned for some more Battlefield 5 coverage as it heads into its launch period, including some news about the December map that's dropping, Panzerstorm. For now, make sure you guys like the video if you enjoyed it and found it helpful, and don't forget to subscribe for some more Battlefield 5 content. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys next time.